Hello everybody and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am Simon, your host here on the show. If you're new here, what happens is, well, this is both a podcast and a YouTube show. We cater to both audiences. So uh, if you're on YouTube, you're looking at me. Or maybe you're not. Maybe it's just on in the background. One of the best things about YouTube Premium, just apart from not getting the ads, is like being able to listen in the background. I got it last year, which is unbelievable. I've been doing YouTube for like six years now. What am I talking about? This isn't a plug for YouTube Premium. This is The Casual Criminalist. I have a script in front of me that Callum, our writer, has put together. I'm looking at it right now, and for some reason, the title's been cut off. So as of this moment, you, dear listener, know more about this episode than I do. Oh, I can see here it starts with Ni hao, friends. So I'm guessing it's about China, because I'm fairly sure that's how you say, like, good day or hello in Mandarin. I don't speak Mandarin. I just know the word for he hello. What happens here, obviously, is Callum writes the script. I will read it. It's my first time going through it. We go on a little adventure together. And then Jen will uh, add some sounds and some video. She's uh, the, the editor on this show. And uh, make it look all pretty for the video viewers. Let's just jump in, shall we? Ni hao, friends! As part of our continuing quest to push Simon's pronunciation skills past breaking point- Oh, Callum, why'd you do this to me? Today we're heading to China. If you're an avid reader of state-sanctioned papers, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the Middle Kingdom is a place where nothing bad ever happens and citizens live in peace and harmony. Yeah, it's because they they control it all there. <laughs> I've been to China. You can't even watch YouTube. I mean, you could- Allegedly, you could do it with a VPN. If a VPN sponsored this show, now would be a perfect time to give them a plug. But they don't. Listen. If you want to sponsor this show, VPNs, you know who to call. Assuming, of course, they're not democracy campaigners. Oh, God. The, look, the pronunciations here are going to be a disaster. I'm going to reveal my ignorance of some things. Like, I have no idea what an Eug here is. But journalists, African, Tibetan, Hong Kongers, or just fans of Winnie the Pooh. The Winnie the Pooh story is great. Do you guys know this story? It's like uh, Xi Jinping, the president? Premier? Glorious leader of China? Um... He, someone was saying he looks like Winnie the Pooh, so they banned images of Winnie the Pooh or something. Is that even true? That kind of feels a bit like it's not true, doesn't it? But China wasn't always the spotless paradise it is today. It was a long road to modernization, with more than a few casualties along the way. Today we're diving deep into a story from the country's belated industrial revolution, which brought with it an age of social upheaval and provided the perfect cover for serial killers to thrive. One of the worst gained the nickname China's Jack the Ripper. That's never going to be a good thing, is it? <laughs> the only thing worse would be like China. As Dr. Shipman, because as we discussed in a previous episode, he killed like 150 people, which blows my mind. Because of his fondness for mutilation and the long enduring mystery of his identity, I oh, well, Shipman doesn't have those, because they caught him and then he killed himself in prison. The best thing he ever did. His part that's really dark, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're looking into his crimes, his past, and the decades longer effort to bring him to justice. China style. Ooh, it's gonna be good. Of course, to stay compliant with our friends at the Chinese Communist Party, I've already taken the liberty of passing the script over to the census for proofing, so let's kick off. I can already see it's like redacted in my script. Our story begins in Redacted, in Redacted Province, where a redacted is on her way home from work on Redacted, Redacted, Redacted. Actually, best we go with the original draft. Yes, because <clears throat> we're not in China. We are not censored by China. Although, what is that sound I hear? <laughs> Just joking. Dark times in buying city. I, I have decided for this episode that I'm mostly going to guess pronunciations. <laughs> You're welcome. Our story begins in Bayan City in Gangzhou province, where a young woman is on her way home from work on Chinese New Year in 2001. She walked alone through the dusty streets of the city, illuminated in technicolor every now and again by the fireworks exploding above. This northwestern copper mining city was once a jewel of Mao's China, a prosperous place built on the back of industrial labor reforms. And no offense to any Bayaners out there, but it's kind of dreary looking place nowadays. I mean, yeah, it used to be a mining town that doesn't mine anymore. What literally the image in my mind is dreariness. After the copper started drying up in the late 80s, the city went into decline, and the children of the Golden Age found themselves tethered to a dying horse. I say tethered because China's Hukou registration system enforces strict restrictions on where people can live and work. Oh, joy. Officially, if you want to spend more than three days in a city other than your registered hometown, you have to apply for a temporary residence permit, essentially a domestic visa, for anything longer than a weekend getaway. That sounds terrible. I've actually been to China a few times. A few times? I've been twice. 
been to, a few times makes it sound like i'm regularly going there i went like 10 years ago and i went a few years ago it's an interesting place i mean i never felt like super oppressed or anything but i guess that's kind of the yeah you just don't when you're visiting uh with jobs drying up much of the citizenry oh i did feel when i went to get my visa and this was after i started doing youtube i think i've told this story i don't know if i've told this story in this channel but in other channels i have and it's like you go i went to the embassy to get my visa and they're like what do you do for a living and i'm like i always say advertising i think i heard it on some podcast with some youtubers i can't remember who it was but they were like yeah just write advertising because you do advertising that's technically how you make all your money like those little ads you see or unless you've got youtube premium um what is up with youtube premium today <laughs> that just say advertising because it doesn't ask so many questions if you put like youtuber or journalist not a journalist but like presenter you're gonna get more questions so i just put advertising and i think they googled me because they invited me in and i had to go and talk to some like not senior person but like more than the person who just stamps the passport and i was like it was it was a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> and i had to sign a bunch of paperwork saying that i wasn't get, they're going there to make movies and i wasn't i was just going on holiday with jobs drying up and much of the citizenry chained to the city's fortune unemployment skyrocketed some like the woman walking home then i managed to make a decent living in one of the remaining factories while others fell into idleness and petty crime aside from its economic and social concerns buy-in had plenty more to worry about in 2001 the suffocating pall had hung over the city throughout the 1990s and i'm not just talking about the pollution the man the myth on that night in 2001 the young woman had no idea she was about to come face to face with the specter which haunted the city for the past 13 years tonight the streets were filled with the noise of family celebrations in the buildings around so she probably never felt the usual unease of a woman walking alone at night in buy in over the past decade stories have been coming out of young women killed and raped with pieces cut from their lifeless bodies news of the crimes have been suppressed and filtered through the official state media but local gossip was unfettered by the censors the people had long known there was a serial killer on the loose as the bodies piled up throughout the 90s the mysterious stalker took on urban legend status and superstitions were shared on how to protect yourself from him it said that he specifically targeted pretty women with long hair who wore high heels and the color red easy then just get a haircut and avoid wearing red that's exactly what most young women and girls in that era did one local resident reminisced when we were growing up kids weren't allowed to go out after dark and my mum never let me wear anything red but of course it wasn't that simple if china's jack the ripper set his sights on you a change of wardrobe wasn't going to stop him when the woman approached her front door he wasn't far behind as she turned the key in the door of her apartment she was attacked from behind a black clad figure grabbed her and tried to drag her inside she desperately fought back scratching and clawing at her assailant's arms until she could throw him off run inside and lock the door behind her the woman then called her husband at work asking him to come home until then she was alone praying that her attacker wouldn't find a way in when she went to look outside there he was laughing at her through the window no attempts to get in no shouting or screaming just standing there mocking her i i get why she called her husband but what on earth are you doing not calling the police i don't know what 999 or 911 is in china but that is a number i would ring i'd be like look look, i'll update my husband on the situation later for now some cops would be nice preferably whatever the chinese call swat the guys with the big guns Bayan's most infamous serial killer was still there still smiling this was the first time anyone had caught sight of his face and lived but by the time the police arrived the gruesome apparition was gone how on how incompetent are the police the guys her husband's literally at work and he gets home faster look if my wife called the police right now she's across town where i live it takes me about i could i could be home in 15 minutes if i absolutely blitzed it the police are going to get there faster way faster what is going on china's police a prolific career this would be one of their best chances of catching the killer in over a decade of hunting him between 1988 and 2002 they attributed 11 murders to the man the majority of which featured horrific acts of sexual violence and mutilation most of the cases also exhibited a similar methodology he would pick women seemingly at random and observe them he would then choose a time during the daytime to follow them home force his way inside rape them and then stab them to death the last two not always in that order it all began on the afternoon of may the 26th 1988 at about 3 p.m that day a 23 year old woman returned home from her job at the buy-in non-ferrous metal company to the staff accommodation she shared with her family she lay down to rest turning on some music on her tape deck and drifted off to sleep shortly after she awoke to a stranger in her room she tried to cry out to her brother sleeping in the next room but the intruder threw his weight down and covered her mouth 
The sound of the cassette tape player drowned out the rest of the noise as she was strangled unconscious and stabbed 26 times with a knife. Her brother kept sleeping just a few feet away while her killer molested the body, then looked through her belongings. He found the woman's photo album and spent time flicking through the pictures, staring into the memories of the person he just brutally butchered. What is wrong with you? If you... Like, that is psycho. You just... That is so psycho. When the police arrived, they found a very different image from the happy young woman in those photos. Her neck had been sliced open, almost breaking through the bone. She had been stripped from the waist down. Her shirt was lifted up, revealing the dozens of stab wounds on her torso. A bloody handprint on the inner thigh gave them a minor break. The print of a right index finger. Analysis of the door handle yielded another, but that would be about as far as the investigation would go. Over the following years, the cops had their hands full with a surge in crime as the city's mining fortunes rapidly waned. However, it'd be six years until the newest thorn in their side graduated into a fully-fledged serial killer. This time it was at the Bayern Power Supply Bureau staff dorms. On the 27th of January 1994, a 19-year-old cleaner came across an unfamiliar man wandering the halls. When she tried to talk to him, he grabbed her and dragged her into a room. She was stabbed 36 times in the upper body. The blood splatters covered an entire wall. Just like the first victim, her throat had been slit. Despite all the gore he had just left behind, the killer still took his time to wash himself down in the communal laundry room at the dorms before taking off. If you think that kind of nonchalant attitude would be their undoing, you clearly have too much faith in the 1990s Chinese police. Look, I didn't really have much faith in the, in the Chinese police because the husband beat them to the crime scene. What is going on? These crime scenes were attended by poorly trained rookies who trampled the evidence and spread their own shoe prints around the area. Really? Guys, just watch like five episodes of CSI and you'll be better off, alright? I think we're giving these guys too much credit. Probably can't get CSI in China. Very little progress was made on either of those cases, beyond the collection of prints and semen samples. Less than one year later, another body turned up in the city of Baotou in Mongolia. Same hallmarks. Same methodology. However, given the fractured nature of policing at the time and strict limits on jurisdictions, it would be a while before detectives made the connection at all. Many of the police stations in rural cities were still using painfully outdated paper filing systems, which made cooperation between different cities a nightmare. There was this was uh, this is familiar. This also came up in one of the U.S. serial killers. Like they just went to a different state and continued killing. It's like no one figured this out. It's like you don't talk to each other. Why not start talking to each other? So they're the opposite of the criminals writing down their crimes. The police should write down the crimes and share the information. Throughout the late 90s, the killer's confidence grew with his infamy. The January 1998 murder of a 29-year-old woman on Shengli Street in Baiyin signaled the beginning of a bloody spree that would see four more victims dead before the end of the year. The neighbors found the victim's body three days later. While most of it, a 13 by 24 centimeter piece of her ear and scalp had been cut off as a grisly souvenir. Um, I don't know what that is in inches and fractions of inches <laughs> i don't know what they're called like the sub inch uh but that is a large chunk of flesh that is not a joke less than one week later china's jack the ripper struck again after meeting a young woman at a dance hall he went with her to her home on sichuan road three days later the neighbors found her body she had been stabbed eight times sexually assaulted and had a 30 by 24 centimeter piece of flesh cut away that's even larger american friends from her breast to her back if you're already appalled by the disco dancing deviant then the next few cases might really challenge your sanity oh what is it's already horrible <laughs> what is, is it just gonna start cutting more and more flesh please stop his next crime would prove to me his most infamous. Returning to the Bayan Power Supply Bureau on the 30th of July, almost four years to the day since he committed his second murder there. This time, he chose an eight-year-old girl as his... Yeah, of course. That was the other option, wasn't it? Brilliant. Her parents returned home to find their daughter's body stuffed into a wardrobe. She had been raped and strangled to death with the belt, which still hung from her neck. This time, the killer's calling card was a glass of tea, half-finished and nonchalantly left on the kitchen table. Now I'm left wondering how the hell I managed to lighten the tone after that. I don't really know if you can, Callum, but I do like that this was the most infamous one, so I guess the others are going to be less horrific, because honestly, that is a uh, that is a serious bar of horrificness, if that is a word. There was clearly no limit to how low the serial killer was willing to go, and the rest of his crimes continued the trend of increasingly creative depravity. Next was the case of Q Momo, a young woman who the killer followed home at 10 a.m., on November the 30th, as she returned from the night shift at Bayan Salt Factory. You know the drill by this point. No need for me to describe the scene. The only extra detail here was the dismemberment of the hands, breast, and genitals of the woman. Callum, you had to describe the extra detail. <laughs> this got worse. The killer had taken them all with him. 
Despite this sharp uptick in the killer's body count, you'd be amazed to learn that no official warning had been released to the public. The only information the women of Bayan had to go on were the rumors circulating around town, which at this point had reached a fever pitch. Yeah, at some point you gotta like, because the rumors will event. I mean, as horrific as this is, there's not been so many victims in, I'm sure, what is a fairly large city, because every city in China is large. I was traveling across China, and there was just some random city that my train stopped in that I'd never heard of, and I had like a 12 hour layover. And I was like, this is an absolutely enormous city that no one's ever heard of. And it had like 10 million people living in it or something insane. China is so big. With extra police funds being diverted into the investigation, China's Jack the Ripper decided to take a hiatus from murder. His shadow remained looming over the city until his return in the new millennium. The killer announced his arrival by murdering a 28-year-old cotton mill worker on November the 20th, 2000 and cutting off her hands. And that brings us right up to date with the botched attempt on Chinese New Year 2001. Finally, after 13 years, the police had a description to go on. So they finally caught the guy, right? Well, no. Still far too much faith. An amateur hour investigation. See, even though nowadays the Chinese police have nationwide DNA databases and super high-tech facial recognition, their capabilities weren't quite so up-to-date 20 years ago. I'm like, Chi it's China. Surely you've like... I can't imagine they get away with this in America. Although, I have been fingerprinted arriving in America. Now you have to, like, I think it's a thumbprint or like it's the, these three things you put on the little scanning machine. And it's like, land of the free, huh? But like, if America has this, I mean, maybe you wouldn't be able to do it to the citizens. But China would be like, you're born fingerprinted. Because... <laughs> It's an authoritarian regime. They can force you to do stuff that you don't want to do. I mean, any country can do that. But in China, particularly so, right? Ever since China's Jack the Ripper started his criminal career, Chinese investigators were hamstrung by outdated procedures and inefficient bureaucracy. In the early 80s, the majority of Chinese police didn't even have the luxury of proper squad cars, police stations, weapons, or even uniforms. A few baton-wielding CCP enforcers in each farming commune might have cut it in the 60s, but modern China was going to need a bit more than that to maintain law and order. Police standardization and modernization only really came up to the party agenda in the mid-1980s, but progress was slow. Even in the early 2000s, the cops involved in the Bayan serial killer case were still comparing fingerprints using a magnifying glass like some twee Sherlock Holmes cosplayers. I was just going to say, it's like, what is this? Sherlock Holmes. That is crazy. In the early 2000s? What? By 2001, they had at least managed to pool all of the killer's crimes into one serial case through the comparison of semen samples and fingerprints from each of the crime scenes. However, the database turned up no matches, despite painstaking comparison to 230,000 sets of prints. The sketches were their best shot at identifying the perp. They now had a trio of images of the killer's face drawn up from the recollections of the survivor, her husband, and a police officer he reckoned he may have seen the attacker in the area. For some reason, though, the cops kept that ace tucked firmly up their sleeve. Zhan Jing, the facial composite expert brought in to assist the investigation, claimed the sketches were withheld from the public in case they caused a negative impact on the investigation. I feel like they'd cause an impact on the investigation of the guy now being on a wanted poster, which, I mean, those have been around for a while. There's that FBI's most wanted list, which is like pages of people who they want to find all over the internet. That seems like a pretty good idea. No? We've seen in previous episodes how public tip hotlines can actually make things worse. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> so that's fair enough. However, there's probably a bit of saving face at play too. I mean, it's a balance, right? I get how, okay, it's going to get overwhelmed with tips. People are going to be reporting all of this stuff and it can cause... It, it was the Bible John one where there was some dude who looked like Bible John, who was the, the Scottish Jack the Ripper. Everyone's like, so and so Jack the Ripper. <laughs> However, there's probably a bit of saving face at play, too. Releasing the image would have meant admitting the presence of a serial killer, which would risk embarrassing the inept detectives and shaking faith in the police. Not only that, to admit the true magnitude of the crime in the city wouldn't just embarrass the local police, but also threaten the Communist Party's narrative, which casts them as the maintainers of harmony and security, something which, in real, something which was in real decline during that era. As a result, it wasn't until 2015 that Qu Jinping, brother to the murdered Qu Mo Mao, even knew that there was a sketch. Instead of relying on public tips, the cops fell back to psychological profiles. They reckoned that the man was a sexually perverted loner between the ages of 33 and 40, patient and calculating with a severe hatred of women. This was the criteria they used for their biggest investigative effort yet, a massive game of guess who encompassing every resident of the city. Yeah, I mean, that's not like that's not really narrowing it down and also how are you going to know this information like hates women perverted loner is all you know something some serial killer psycho can easily hide 
I mean, until they murder people, but like in an in their regular life. The Biden Security Bureau decided that if they didn't have any specific suspects to investigate, they would just investigate everyone. This meant combing through the records of all residents in Biden City, current population 1.7 million, and matching their faces to the sketches. This led to the collection of fingerprints of over 100,000 men and thousands of house searches. You'd think that this kind of spray and pray approach would catch the killer eventually, but no such luck. Take a guess why that might be. As it turns out, the killer wasn't registered in Bayern at all. Over-reliance on the antiquated bureaucratic systems had given the investigators a bad case of tunnel vision. For some reason, it never crossed their minds that a man capable of strangling children to death might also be comfortable bending household registration regulations. Apparently, some lines are just too sacred to cross. While the police were busy rounding up every look-alike in town and checking their fingerprints with a Victorian-era detective kit, the real killer was free to continue his spree. On the morning of May 22, 2001, the Bayern police received a frantic phone call. On the other end of the line, a woman was screaming for help. She told the police there was a man trying to kill her, but the call cut off before she could give an address. Tragically, her apartment was just one block down the road from the station which took the call. By the time the police eventually got there, the woman was long dead. Had they been able to respond in time, they almost definitely would have got their man. This near miss ended up costing one more young woman her life about a year later. On the 9th of February 2002, China's Jack the Ripper staked out the Tao Le Chun hostel in Bayan looking for a victim. One woman caught his eye, 25-year-old Zhu Mamao, a long-term resident of the rundown boarding house. Several days later, her decomposing body was found in her room. For reasons unknown at the time, this would be the last murder in the 14-year spree. Despite millions of yuan and tens of thousands of investigation hours, it looks like the police missed their chance. Without any further crime scenes to go on, they took to poring over old reports and evidence. What they found was, to put it mildly, an absolute shambles. As we mentioned, many of the crime scenes had been contaminated by inexperienced officers, making much of their findings pretty much worthless. The officers who should have watched some CSI. The trail got colder and colder, leading the investigators to their very last resort, informing the public. In 2004, they finally admitted to the people of Bayan that a serial killer investigation was underway. <laughs> Guys, it's about bloody time. To which the exhausted women of the city cried, no sh**, or whatever that is in Chinese, I'm sure it's, it's different. The fine folks of the Bayan City Public Security Bureau outlined the menace in a long overdue report titled, Bayan City Public Security Bureau's Propaganda Outline for Detecting a Series of Rape and Murder Cases. <laughs> what sort of name is that? You can't even, like, you'd be at the end and they'd be like, you know, like the Americans do. And that sums down to Patriot Act or whatever. No, it's just insanely long. It's very bureaucratic, like you imagine it would be coming out of China. The announcement was accompanied with a 200,000 won reward for any information leading to his capture, which is around $25,000 at the time. Finally, the spectre which had haunted the city for over 10 years had been officially recognized, but even then, no closer to being identified. Over the following decade, China's Jack the Ripper faded into history. Detectives who had worked the case for decades retired, while family members of the victims lost hope of a conclusion. The murderer became a local boogeyman that parents would warn their children about to stop them staying out late. Kui Jinping continued to visit the security bureau every few days to ask questions about the investigation into his sister's death. He kept it up year after year, desperate for some good news to deliver to his grieving family. By 2011, hope was running pretty much dry. The memory of the case flared up again once one of the investigators released an open letter online apologizing to the families. It read, I have never been able to catch you. For the younger generation and the bereaved of the victims, I am a sinner for a lifetime. Chin up, mate. We're not at the end of the episode yet. An unlikely break. To put everyone out of their misery, we're skipping forward again to 2016. By then, China had pretty much completed its metamorphosis into a wealthy world superpower, and their police forces had updated their systems to match. The DNA analysis now available to detectives must have seemed like Star Trek tech to their predecessors. With a fair bit of luck, it would end up being the key to the whole thing. Early in 2016, an elderly man was arrested in Bayan and charged with attempting to bribe a police officer. The cops took a DNA cheek swab from the man at the station, as had become standard procedure, and when they ran it through the system, they found something shocking. He was a partial match for China's Jack the Ripper. Finally, after 30 years, an actual lead. Ooh, so it's going to be someone related to him. It was only a partial match, but similar enough that the police knew the murderer had to be in the old guy's immediate family tree. Obvious, obviously, female relatives were ruled out. So they then categorized the male family members by age and location. Only one person fit the bill, the 52-year-old shopkeeper by the name of Gao Cheng Yong, the old man's nephew. The police must have second-guessed themselves. Could the city's most feared psychopath really be this unremarkable, portly, mild-mannered little man? 
Had they really been outwitted for decades by him? Oh, and in these things we often learn. It's like they have a real, you know, serial killers, psychopaths, they have very good masks. Gao Cheng Yong, a retrospective. If Gao Cheng Yong were the killer, it would come as a surprise to everyone he knew. Most of all, his wife of 30 years, Zhan Qing Feng, and his two grown up sons. They all knew Gao as a quiet man, unemotional, but with a strong sense of duty towards his family. He was born in 1964 in the small rural village of Qingcheng, Yuzhong County, about 75 miles from Bai In. Raised in a poor farming family, he had aspirations of becoming a pilot, but was devastated when he never made the cut. Gao later told his friends that he had been forced off the program for political reasons. After failing to enter any kind of higher education, he settled for becoming a laborer, like hundreds of millions of others in those days. With the meager earnings he got from various odd jobs, he provided palliative care for his father throughout a prolonged terminal illness. Google Translate offered up the beautifully direct quote from one of his old neighbors, Gao was behaved when he was a child. He wiped his father's to and urine. He was extremely filial. <laughs> Thanks, Google Translate. Telling it like it is. Hardly sounds like a cold-blooded killer, right? After the filial son's father's passing away in the mid-80s, he decided it was time for a change, and a modernizing China offered him a chance one. The Deng Xiaoping era saw the Hoku residence system relax. The new loosened restrictions meant that unskilled workers were allowed to drift around the country as they pleased, picking up work wherever it could be found. The only catch was that while outside of their designated hometowns, they were unable to access public health care, education, and social security. That was a no-brainer for a laborer from a poor farming community, so Gao and his wife decided to move to buy in, and they never registered there. When Zhang gave birth to their first child, she stayed home with her mother for a while, leaving Gao alone in the city. He spent the next few years split between short-term jobs in Bai Yin, long stints in his hometown, and construction work in Bao To in Mongolia. Even when his wife and kids rejoined him, he would disappear for days at a time, supposedly working or on a binge at his beloved dance halls. Gao Chen Yong's life continued on like this without any major incidents. He was a distant husband, but he provided well enough for his family. In 2015, with Gao now in his 50s, the couple took over the campus shop at Bayan Technical School. A nearby barbershop owner described the new shopkeeper as quiet, like a school teacher. But the community around the school was in for a horrific revelation. On the 26th of August, two plainclothes police officers entered the campus shop to arrest Gao Chen Yong. A DNA test confirmed it. They had their man. The quiet, filial husband and father was responsible for the brutal rape and murder of 11 women and girls. When Gao the Ripper realized what was happening, he tried to make a break for it, but never made it to the door. A security guard at the school recalled watching him being dragged away, saying, I thought he had some disease. It's a few years too early for that, my man. Ooh, okay. Confessions and Recollections Down at the station, the interrogations got underway. When asked if he knew why he was there, the suspect reportedly said that it was because he had killed people. Although, when the Chinese security forces get a hold of you, a confession pretty much comes as standard, guilty or not. It's only sensible to be skeptical of anything coming out of the interrogation rooms. But as if to clear up any lingering doubts we might have about his guilt, Gao waited until the interrogators left the room and attempted to kill himself by smashing his head into a chair repeatedly. A bit of an unorthodox suicide attempt and thoroughly unsuccessful. All he needed was three stitches. With that out of his system, Gao decided the only course of action to mitigate his misfortunes would be to tell them everything. With a blank expression, he confessed to all 11 murders, offering details which only he could know and revealing horrific new ones that gave the cops and media more to chew on. Gao rattled off each murder one after the other over the course of several hours. According to police reports, he even remembered the exact time of day which each slaying took place. As one interrogator put it, Gao's calmness is unimaginable. Terrifying. He remembers everything clearly. Apparently, Gao the Ripper had started out as a petty criminal rather than a cold-blooded killer. He claimed that he was only breaking into his first victim's house to burgle the place. The murder was to avoid being caught. That doesn't exactly add up with the two dozen-plus stab wounds, but, well, whatever. He then explained how he had taken the photo album with him and burned it before returning home to his wife. The investigators asked Gao how old his eldest son was when his father raped and murdered an eight-year-old girl. Ten, Gao replied, in a matter-of-fact tone. One of the detectives told the press, I stared at him, and he stared back for almost ten seconds before lowering his head. My fist was raised. I almost slammed it into his face. If you ask me, chances are the whole suicide by chair thing was just a cover story for a bit of rough justice doled out in the interrogation room. Not condoning it, of course, but it is a bit satisfying to imagine. Yeah, can't condone that, but I mean...
Oh no. <laughs> It was in the year of that most infamous murder, 1998, that Gao's confidence in his methods peaked. He explained feeling an overwhelming bloodlust throughout the entire year. That's when his fondness for mutilation really took off. As for the souvenirs, he claimed to have thrown all the dismembered body pieces into the Yellow River. By this point, Gao and his wife were living in a tiny hut in his hometown again. He would travel to downtown buy-in solely for the purpose of killing, always careful to otherwise obey the law and avoid fingerprinting. The increased police attention to his crimes after that little quartet of killings forced Gao to lay low for a while, but eventually he just felt the need to kill someone. Simple as that. For once a serial killer, he doesn't make himself out to be a genius. <laughs> yeah, it's like unrelentingly serial killers I, I, maybe it's got something to do with the psychopathy, I don't know, but it's like they think they're so smart. It's like you're getting caught so easily. <laughs> Often by writing down your crimes. Gao's not even saying he's a genius, but it doesn't seem like he's writing down his crimes. It does seem like he's disposing of evidence. Smart curious serial killer moves. He's not saying he's a genius. He's an absolute Gao admitted to being just a guy who really loved murdering, and not even in a particularly organized fashion. His self-admitted sloppiness must have really twisted the knife in of the ego of the police, who he had run circles around for 28 years. Oh, and he never cared about the red clothes or high heels, that was all just gossip. In reality, he just picked whoever he could find. As for why Gao stopped kill killing completely, he explained that he was simply getting too old for it. In 2002, he was pushing 40, rocking an impressive beer belly, and realized that he wasn't quite as fit as he used to be. It seems like getting beaten in a wrestling match by a woman half his size and age put a bit of a check into the killer's confidence. By this point, his second son was growing up fast and attending school in Bayan alongside his big brother. Gao needed money to pay for their upkeep and education, so he did what every parent has to do. He put aside his hobbies for the sake of his kids. What a sweetheart. The dedicated family man went back to Inner Mongolia to take on a construction job and never killed again. His crime spree ended as arbitrarily as it had begun, offering no closure for anyone involved. Even now, the families of the victims had no real explanation of why he carried out the killings. They didn't even get an apology. You expected one? He just killed because he liked killing. Unfortunately, some people are just that f***ed up. Did you ever feel any remorse for your victims or their families? One detective asked. Gao just shook his head. Execution and resolution. Despite finally having their man behind bars, freely admitting his crimes, the police enjoyed little relief. The whole affair had been an embarrassment for the Regional Security Bureau, a case that was opened back when the current top brass were just rookies. Looking back, it should have been resolved long ago. One retired cop who worked the case told the press, I felt ashamed rather than happy. I can't believe the real killer had been living under our nose for so long while we targeted other groups of people. The case confused me and my colleagues for so many years. It does seem a bit mad that they threw all their investigative power at Bayan residents alone and never considered that the killer might be someone drifting through the city over the years. A 90-minute commute basically put Gao beyond suspicion. How many lives could have been saved if the police had access to better tools or practiced better organization? Potentially more than we ever previously thought, because there have been whispers that Gao's body count might be much higher than he ever admitted, which would seem strange, because he seemed to very willingly, openly admit it. And he's in China. He knows he's going to get the death penalty. So a bit strange that he wouldn't just carry on admitting to them all. Where else might China's Jack the Ripper have wandered to? And did he really hang up his boots and blades after 2002? Or does Inner Mongolia have some cold cases that really need to be looked into? The opaqueness of Chinese crime and punishment makes speculation pretty much impossible. So let's just wrap up the ones we know. When the case came to trial, Gao Chenyong was charged with 11 murders, along with rape, robbery, and the desecration of corpses. It's worth noting that Chinese courts have a 99.965% conviction rate, so don't expect any big twists coming up. Good lord, that is one in like 999 out of 1,000 guilty you're getting your punishment, which in this case, he's like, yeah, I'm 99.965% sure. Gonna get executed. You know, he would have admitted to the other murders, surely. Gao's defense lawyer, Zhu A. Jun, described his client as old and haggard during the meetings at the detention center. Being a defense lawyer in China is a bit like being a pro surfer in the Sahara. I was gonna say, like, what is this guy's job? As uh, so the main purpose of these meetings wasn't to help his client dodge the death penalty, Zhu was mostly there to help tie up the case neatly. <laughs> great defense. His meetings with Gao continued for a, across a year-long preparation period, which is unusual in Chinese law. The reason given was that they wanted to make sure they could confirm all of his cases beyond a shadow of a doubt, and so no accomplices or copycats would be let off the hook. Gao planned all along to plead guilty, but still declined to attach an apology. The only time he became even slightly emotional was during conversations about the little girl he murdered. 
in a fleeting moment of awareness he said he saw himself as a villain dude that is a gargantuan understatement on the 18th of July, Gao Zhengong's closed-door trial began at the Intermediate People's Court of Baiyan City. The man himself appeared before the judges wearing a saggy grey polo shirt and confessed to all of the crimes across the course of two days. It would be another nine months until the public sentencing, which happened on March the 30th, 2018. Gao was, of course, sentenced to death. On top of that, he would be deprived of all political rights for life, which sounds kind of inconsequential in a dictatorship <laughs> yes when the judgment was handed down gao drank a glass of water turned to the victim's family in the gallery and bowed three times the government would be seizing all of his assets but since he didn't have enough to cover the civil compensation he offered to donate all of his organs two decades of unimaginable pain and suffering but you can have my liver and we'll call it square i assume he could like could he sell the organs or something and the money go to the families that sounds a bit weird but maybe it's possible Gao disappeared from the courtroom, never to be seen again. He was presumably ferried back to a squalid prison to live out his last few remaining days. His death was kept as mysterious as his crimes. On January the 3rd, 2019, a message was posted on the buying court's Weibo, Weibo, something social media account. 54-year-old Gao Cheng Yong had been executed by methods undisclosed. <laughs> on the social media account, that's how we do it. Serial killing with Chinese characteristics. Just like that, the ghost which had haunted the people of Bayan for three decades was exercised a hidden, anticlimactic end to a horrifically brutal story. All that's left is for us to take a quick look at the conditions which led to this sadist running amok and some of the other maniacs who took advantage of them. We've already seen how the antiquated Hukyo system gave the police a bad case of tunnel vision. That's the one about the people moving districts, right? But the blame doesn't lie entirely with the investigators. They were working during a period of unimaginably vast change in society. In the Mao era, the presence of serial killers would have been seen as essentially impossible. How could such people exist in such a perfect society? That kind of naivety was a direct result of concerted propaganda by the government. But as China started to become a capitalist country, although don't let President Xi ever hear you say it, the dynamics of cities and families were thrown into flux, and the police were totally unequipped to deal with the challenges that were unleashed. Like I said before, most didn't even have squad cars or uniforms in 1980. It wasn't until brothers Wang Zhong Fang and Wang Zhong Wei went on an eight-month spree of murder and robbery that the higher-ups started to wake up to the dangers of the new China. The Wang brothers killed over a dozen soldiers and cops with guns and grenades. The communist dream was on the decline, and with it waned the propaganda-enforced solidarity of the poor farming communities that were once the darlings of the party. By the time our man Gao's killing career was in full swing, much of rural China had become a kind of wild west. Poor laborers left their communities behind and drifted around in search of work. Naturally, many decided that honest work is actually pretty tricky, and that they should turn to crime instead. This was the start of a truly modern China, and with it came a distinctly modern phenomenon, the serial killer. One anonymous source at the Bayan Security Bureau told the New Republic magazine that Gao wasn't even the only one. Apparently, there were almost certainly several serial killers operating in or around the city during its heyday. They'll remain forever unknown. We do know of a few other Chinese serial killers from around the country. One of the most heinous was Yang Xing Hai, the so-called monster killer. He would break into countryside homes and massacre everyone inside, wiping out multiple generations of a family line in minutes. All in all, he claimed 67 official victims, making him China's worst ever murderer. But then there was Yang Shu Bin and his gang. Around the turn of the millennium, he would go to the karaoke bar brothels and make sure of himself as a rich businessman. He would offer to double the going rate to take a woman home with him, where he, his girlfriend, and two old schoolmates would tie up the victims and torture them for bank details. After robbing the women, the gang would murder them, grind up their remains, and then dispose of them down drains. That's just a quick snapshot of some of the worst crimes of China's modern history. But, like I said, we'll never know the full extent of them. Dr. Mike Amert of Radford University told the New Republic, Countless countries such as China do suppress information about crime. One must be very cautious in interpreting any crime statistics from these countries, including the frequency of serial murder. I would not be surprised if the actual rate is similar to the rate in the United States. A population like China's over four times that of the US could expect over 10,000 serial killers, not the official statistic of 62. That's right, the CCP have cheated me out of 9,938 plus episode ideas. This time we've gone too far. Ah, uh, and just finally, we have a wrap up on this rather lengthy episode today. And that finishes us up for today. I hope you've enjoyed our little field trip. Callum, that is not enjoyed, is not a word I would necessarily use to describe what has happened in today's episode. Uh, and I'd love to hear what countries and serial killers you'd like to feature in the like us to feature in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Use the comments if you're watching on YouTube. Um, 
you got future ideas for international ones that may be lesser known than the old usuals like Ted Bundy and Jack the Ripper and all that, we can cover them. As for China, you'd like to think that the modernized police force could snap up reckless opportunists like Gao Cheng Yong in a day or two, but the government's deep pockets have resulted in a new brand of authoritarian control supercharged by technology and data collection. I'm talking 200 million CCTV cameras connected to an AI tracking system in their Skynet project, and 2 million operatives employed just to monitor microblogs. Some estimate that their total internet police force is many multiples bigger. In other words, the golden age of Chinese serial killers is probably long behind us. Good! The few that we do know are every bit as sadistic as your familiar favorites from the West, and if you'll indulge me a bit of pure, unfounded speculation, perhaps Gao Chenyong was one of the very worst. What if, in order to avoid future police embarrassment, the full extent of Gao's crimes were concealed? If he had continued killing in Inner Mongolia after 2004, might they not have been incentivized just to exclude those murders, snipping the case off at the very first major public announcement? Again, just based on the speculation, but I have to throw all of the conspiracy lovers a bit of a bone every now and then. Yeah, I mean, I don't generally like conspiracy theories. I think they're a bit silly. But reasonable conspiracy theories is like, yeah, okay, I get it. It's a fairly reasonable conspiracy theory. Number one. If you still haven't had enough of Chinese true crime, here's another tidbit. In 1995, Beijing resident Li Pingbing was frustrated with his station in life. After being fired from his job, he murdered his former boss, uh, along with his wife and child. After that, he got a job as a taxi driver and murdered four prostitutes between 2002 and 2003. How's this guy walking around? If your boss dies, is murdered, and your wife and child are murdered, they, they're gonna know it's you, dude. Come on. <laughs> when captured by the police, he said he was jealous the women made more money than him. Number two, you might be surprised to hear that despite strict information control, China has its own true crime community. Note to Simon, please learn fluent Mandarin and get that sweet, sweet China money. <laughs> no problem, Callum. <laughs> On it. For Gao's case, students at a Chinese law school organized an online forum to solve the crime. Some ex officers even contributed clues and evidence to the some ex officers even have contributed clues and evidence images to the chat. Number three, a colleague of the first victim named Lu Xumin gave us a window into the comedy of errors that was the early investigation. He recounted that when the body was found, the police brought in a sniffer dog from a town 60 miles away to investigate. When the dog arrived, it couldn't do its job. The poor pup had gotten motion sickness on the way over. That's a light-hearted note to end it on today. This has been another episode of The Casual Criminalist, a long one today. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you're uh, watching this on YouTube, there's a like button you can use. There's also a dislike button you can use if you don't like this show. <laughs> then why did you watch all the way to the end? But thank you anyway. Don't forget to subscribe. You can also do that if you're listening to this as a podcast. And if you are listening to this as a podcast, why not leave me a five-star review? Why not, eh? And thanks for watching. Or listening.